A heavy bombardment from land, sea, and air, which began on Sunday, the British today started their attack on the Italian base at Tobruk. And this evening it was reported in Cairo that both outer and inner defenses had been penetrated to a depth of five miles on a broad front and that great numbers of prisoners had been taken. In Cairo, it is expected that mopping up of the garrison of 20 or 30,000 men will be completed in a day or two. In the meantime, the British are increasing their pressure from two sides on Italian possessions in East Africa, though as yet with apparently small forces. In Albania, however, the Italians are counterattacking with vigor, and while they seem to have been repulsed on all fronts, the Greek advance has suffered at least a temporary check. No air raids have been reported in northern Europe tonight, though today German planes made a few nuisance raids on England. There's more trouble in Romania. Last night, a broadcast by the totalitarian premier, General Antonescu, which sounded like an appeal to the people, was abruptly cut off. And for 24 hours, no more news came directly from Romania. So far as can be gathered from the reports from other Balkan capitals and Berlin... The trouble began two days ago with the killing of a German staff officer by a person variously described as a Greek, a Turk, and a British secret agent. Police action seems to have been slow, and the Minister of the Interior was dismissed. Then, apparently, Premier Antonescu tried to dismiss all policemen who belonged to the fascist Iron Guard. This led to rioting by an Iron Guard faction in which the radio station and telegraph offices seemed to have been held for a time by the insurgents, who, according to Budapest stories, were, heavy, were attacked by Romanian troops and tanks. Half an hour ago came a heavily censored dispatch from Romania announcing that an agreement had been reached to end the grave situation in the capital and that Antonescu had given the rest of the country 24 hours to reestablish peace and order. What will happen if they don't reestablish it is not stated. But since the dispatch sounds as if there had been sort of compromise, some sort of compromise in Bucharest itself, it is possible that, as other Balkan capitals believe, the German army of occupation may simply take over the government of the country. Ernest Bevan, British Minister of Labor, told Parliament today that more workers, men and women, were needed in the war industries, and that if there were not sufficiently, sufficient voluntary transfers, compulsion might have to be exercised, without exception, he said, of rank or anything else. Meanwhile, the Russians are commemorating the anniversary of Lenin's death, with the secretary of the Communist Party declaring that Russia must improve its defenses as the international situation contains possibilities of the gravest eventualities to which the Soviet Union cannot be indifferent. The British today suppressed the London Communist newspapers, the Daily Worker and the Week, on the ground of persistent opposition to the national war effort. But tonight, the State Department announced that our moral embo placed last winter on shipments of airplanes to Russia had been lifted. Ground for the embargo was the bombing of the civilian population of Finland, which of course has ceased, and the revocation is an obvious move of foreign policy. But it's not likely to give the Russians many planes, since American capacity is already booked up. Ambassador Kennedy, testifying on the lease land bill before the House Foreign Affairs Committee, favored some amendments, such as a time limit on the president's powers and the establishment of a small congressional committee to advise him. Mr. Kennedy said, however, that Congress would have to surrender some of its powers and warned against revision of the bill that would slow down aid to Britain. When asked how far we could help the British without getting into the war, he said there was a very great risk no matter what we might do, and he believed the president's policy entailed the least risk for the greatest good. And that's the news to this moment.